daunting limitation for satellites to actually observe the surface of the planet. Even high clouds high up in the atmosphere and the troposphere can actually completely block a satellite's view uh, in the visible and in the infrared, which are wavelengths that we would like to look at to try and estimate the Earth's radiation budget and other things. So most satellites would like, to uh, would like to overcome that and they tend to use microwave wavelengths to penetrate clouds or radar. Uh, some, of the more later, some of the later sensors use uh, radar instead. And that allows them to probe the interior of clouds and indeed sometimes all the way through clouds to the surface to pick up information about the surface. So you can use different microwave wavelengths uh, to infer a lot more detailed information about clouds, the particles within them, the precipitation rates from those clouds, etc. And you can also get sea surface temperature as well as precipitation rates derived from microwave radiation measurements from satellites. So this figure shows uh, a two-year set showing the average amount of cloud in percent at each location on the globe. So when you go to blue, to light blue, that represents a very high frequency. So if you look at that particular location uh, from space, you are more likely than not see a lot of cloud there. And you can see that the most persistent regions of cloud seem to be the Southern Ocean, the North Atlantic, and the Northern Pacific in particular. And the clouds uh, in these regions, they're not particularly convective, they're not very deep. They're actually low-lying so-called stratocumulus clouds over what we call the ocean, uh, marine boundary layer. So these are ocean clouds in the, over the ocean surfaces. And they're fairly low, around about a kilometre or so above the ocean surface. But you can see they're very, very persistent. So we have to understand those, how they're formed, how they interact with radiation, in order to validate climate models. So, let's have a, a look at the problem from a different perspective. Clouds are extremely complex. We're just going to look at a very simple set of clouds, those low-lying persistent clouds, which are mainly water. But the problem with clouds is once, they can, once you have water vapor condensing onto existing aerosol particles, mostly soluble particles, we call cloud condensation nuclei, those particles, those cloud droplets, can potentially turn into ice as well. So unfortunately, clouds can undergo phase changes from liquid to ice. Unfortunately, ice is even more complex in terms of the processes that can go on. And in order to simulate clouds, the different processes within them on the micro scale, how they produce precipitation, we need some of the world's biggest computers. This is actually the Japan Earth Simulator from a few years ago. At the time, it was the most powerful computer in the world, not anymore. It was capable of uh, producing about 130 teraflops in terms of processing power. So those are the sorts of computers we have to use but even they can't include all the physical processes to describe clouds. So we have to simplify how we present clouds in these models. So, why are clouds important? Well, remember when we talked about the Earth's radiation budget? Without clouds, the Earth's albedo would be very different, much lower. Clouds are responsible for scattering back 24% of top of the atmosphere downwelling solar radiation in those solar wavelengths back to space. So we have to understand the way clouds scatter light back to space. We need to know where they form, etc., etc. Uh, and to do that, we can then look at the total budget of the Earth's shortwave radiation that eventually gets through to the Earth's surface. And that, of course, is going to be responsible for the upwelling long wave, which is then going to get absorbed in the atmosphere by other processes. Now, if you actually go into a real cloud and measure the number and size of individual cloud droplets, which is what we do, you'll see that they tend to vary from, say, a few microns up to maybe 100 microns, typically. The average radius is around about 7 to 18 microns. In some textbooks, you'll see they use diameters instead. So... 1 to 50 microns is fairly typical of a diameter, but they can exist up to much larger sizes, up to 100 microns in diameter. 
and those are what we call drizzle droplets. Then when we get up to much larger sizes again, say one millimeter or so, that's what we call a raindrop. And the processes that actually produce rain droplets have to start out with droplets of those sizes. So how do we get from little droplets of, say, 1 to 50 microns or so up to, say, 1 millimetre or larger? Well, we're not going to talk about that in this course, but the process is extremely important, obviously, for producing precipitation. And in order to get that precipitation formed, you need a range of drop sizes and particularly need a certain number of large droplets. Why? Because those large droplets tend to have a larger sedimentation velocity. Remember, if you have an air parcel at the surface with water vapour, it's warmer than the surrounding air, for example, it would start to rise at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Eventually, that parcel would cool to a point where the water vapour starts to condense out. That's what we call the lifting condensation point, or lifting condensation level. As the parcel continues to rise, remember, as the condensed water vapour out, the add latent heat due to the phase change from vapour to liquid, and of course that tends to increase the parcel's turbulence. If you've ever flown through a cloud in an aeroplane, it gets very bumpy. Part of the reason is because you've got lots of latent heat being generated, as well as lots of updraft from below. So as that cloud parcel then rises, more and more of the water vapour is condensed out until we run out of water vapour when you get to the top of the cloud. So that process eventually will produce a range of different drop sizes. The big droplets tend to sediment out a little bit more compared to the small droplets, which are kept a lot by turbulence. As those big droplets fall, they sweep out, collide with the smaller droplets, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that process is extremely efficient. It's called collision and coalescence. And eventually, you produce rain droplets, which then fall out. If, of course, the temperature falls below zero and you've got rather special uh, aerosol particles called ice nuclei around, then you can also form ice. And then all, all bets are off, because once you form ice, you can then glaciate the entire cloud, you can produce snow. Ice is very important in clouds and in the atmosphere. 50% of the precipitation we get in the northern hemisphere actually starts out in the ice phase. It may not reach the ground as ice, because it might melt, but the ice phase is very important. Unfortunately, we don't have time in this course to talk about ice. We're going to talk simply about simple, liquid, low-lying stratocumulus clouds. So to actually measure these clouds, as, this, as part of this experiment we'll describe in a moment, we have to use a range of instruments, and these are some of them from Manchester University, fitted to a research aircraft, which took part in this experiment. And you see we need a large number of instruments because we have a very large range of particle sizes. Occasionally ice might form even in these low-lying clouds, so we have to measure the shape of the particles to distinguish them from liquid droplets, and we have to measure lots of other properties including their scattering properties. So we have a huge range of these instruments that we have to unfortunately operate just to probe the microphysical properties of these clouds. So, I'm sure some of you have already seen this graph in other courses. This is the way we tend to a plot the number size distribution of particles in the atmosphere. There are different ways of doing this depending on the textbook we looked at, but this is what's called a normalized dn d log r plot. What do we mean by that? Well, imagine different instruments essentially measure and count the number of particles as a function of size. They then simply put all the particles of a certain size within a particular size bin or channel. Different instruments have different size bins, so how do we compare different instruments? Well, what you do is you normalise the total counts in a particular size channel by the width of that bin. Some people, depending on the size range, will simply use the linear width of that bin. Other people will use the logarithm of the change of that size bin. In other words, you take the log of the high end of the bin minus the log of the low end of the bin and divide it into the counts within that bin. And when you do that, you can then intercompare different instruments. Some people plot it against the particle diameter. This one uses the particle radius. Now, so the green curve here shows the aerosol number size distribution, which, again, some of you have probably seen before in other courses. And you can see this mode down at very small sizes, which is essentially due to the production of aerosol particles from trace gases, so these precursor trace gases then essentially nucleate to form new particles in the atmosphere, such as sulfates, 
and you get this big mode here. Eventually, all those very small aerosols will then uh, come together through a process called coagulation or accumulation and produce another mode in the so-called submicron accumulation mode, and that's where most of these aerosols end up. Then we have another mode down here for big or coarse aerosol particles. Those are generated mechanically at the surface by wind-driven processes, such as the wind blowing over the sea, producing breaking waves, bubbles, etc., uh, but also lifting dust from deserts and soils and so forth. So this is the mechanically produced aerosol size mode. But some of those aerosols in this mode, particularly the soluble ones, act as cloud condensation nuclei. And if we raise the parcel up to a point where the saturation vapor pressure is high enough to allow water vapor to condense on them, then we start to produce cloud droplets. And once we produce a cloud droplet, they're very good at scavenging water vapor molecules and growing to quite large sizes very rapidly. And that's what that blue curve shows here. So this is a typical cloud droplet size distribution that's produced from a typical aerosol size distribution like that. So those are the cloud droplets, but that's an average, very much an average. The size distribution can vary quite a lot due to various thermodynamic issues, such as mixing of air with more or less water vapor into the cloud as it forms. And there are various other processes as well we can't go into here. But one might tend to see a range of size distributions that look like this. And it's important to know the relative contributions of small and large droplets because that controls how fast rainfall is produced. This one, you'll notice, is just the DNDD number distribution, which is what modelers tend to use versus diameter. If you look at those size distributions, there's something quite interesting about them. If you were to work out the average drop size in each of those distributions, they'd actually be the same. So the average size is actually not going to tell you an awful lot. You have to know what the relative contributions are from the different sizes in order to understand some of the processes that are going on. Uh, we'll skip this one, you can look at it yourself, this just shows the same thing again, but now we've added the rainfall size distribution at the back end there. And another reason why clouds are so important, of course, is that they act as cleansing agents, if you like, in the atmosphere. They tend to process any aerosol through formation, but through uh, activation of uh, aerosols, and they then chemically process them, and then, of course, when rain is produced, all those initial aerosols will be removed through what we call wet deposition, precipitation to the surface. That can be a good thing, or if the aerosols represent lots of highly polluted, toxic aerosols, that can be a bad thing. So we have to understand this process of cloud processing as well. Okay, let's get back to our low-level clouds. As we said, low-level stratocumulus cover a very significant fraction of the world's oceans, particularly the higher uh, latitudes. They typically exist at the top of the marine boundary layer within about a kilometre or so above the ocean surface. That means that they're actually thermodynamically coupled to the ocean surface underneath. In terms of the radiation, because they're quite close to the surface, it means that they radiate in the infrared at a fairly similar temperature to the uh, underlying ocean. However, it's not the thermal infrared radiation we're interested in. We're interested in their impact on the shortwave visible because they are very, very bright, as we saw in the last lecture when we looked at the various albedos of components in the atmosphere compared to the underlying surfaces. So the high albedo is something we're interested in, and hence the optical depth of the clouds as opposed to the optical depth of an aerosol layer, which we talked about last time. And if you fly over the top of these stratocumulus clouds, you can see they're very bright, although the albedo can vary depending upon the number and size of droplets. So let's think a little bit about that in this lecture. Um, let's look at an old uh, um, experiment from the 1990s. And this is an experiment conducted off the coast of Colorado, California, whatever, near Los Angeles. And those little lines up there show the flight paths of an aircraft, a research aircraft, which took off from just south of Los Angeles and flew into the stratocumulus deck off the coast of Los Angeles. So it flew above the clouds and it spiraled down through the clouds near to the surface of the ocean, spiraled back up, and it did that several times before flying back home again. 
So let's just look at some of these old results now because they're still valid today. And again, some of these variables you're not going to know, are not, not going to be required to uh, know very much about in this course except this one over here. We'll talk, about more. we'll talk more about that in a moment. But let's just look at the typical measurements that they made. The first thing they measured was the total water content. What do we mean by the total water content? It's essentially the amount of water vapour plus the liquid water. Remember, the water vapour can condense to form clouds. So we have to add up the water vapour plus any liquid. And that gives us what's called QT. The units in this particular case are grams per kilogram. And what's the first thing you notice when you plot all those aircraft profiles of QT based on the in-situ measurements? Well, you'll see it's pretty constant up to just below about 900 metres. What does that tell you? Well, QT in a boundary layer which is thermodynamically coupled, well coupled to the underlying surface without any ingress of other water vapour or other um, meteorological phenomena. That means that it's actually a nice tracer for what we call a well-mixed boundary layer. In other words, it's a conserved quantity. And the fact that it's a straight line shows that in this particular case, the layer is in thermodynamic equilibrium and is, is um, developing in what we call a well-mixed layer. So this is the layer closest to the surface, which we call the marine boundary layer. You also then notice that as we go above about 900 metres, we have very little total water. In other words, what we have down here is a nice moist layer with lots of water vapour and or liquid, whereas above we seem to have a much drier layer on average. So we've got two separate layers, a nice dry layer on top of a nice moist layer over the ocean. We see something similar in the next slide. Now this is a measure of temperature, and this is another conserved quantity. This is uh, what's called the liquid water static energy temperature, it's a bit complicated, but essentially it takes into account the presence of water vapour using um, specific heat capacity and the total entropy associated with the air. But again, when you see a straight line like this, in terms of this static temperature, it means that it's a well-mixed boundary layer. Well, you'll notice that the temperature is actually quite low, but then as we go into this layer above, it's much higher. So effectively what we've got is a nice, moist, fairly low temperature marine boundary layer, whereas on top, in this particular location, we've got a very dry, warm layer sitting on top. And that dry, warm layer helps to stabilise this layer it prevents any convection penetrating into the layer aloft or mixing across that layer. And the degree to which it can stabilise depends upon how big this temperature inversion is. Now, what about the clouds? Well, we can measure the amount of liquid as well. So that's the liquid part of QT. And again, these are lots of different aircraft profiles with lots of different clouds in the same region based on those spirals you can see there, descents and ascents. And you'll notice that when the air mass reaches the condensation level, we start to condense water vapour into liquid. As we go higher and higher, more and more water vapour is condensed into liquid, so the liquid water content increases up to the top of that temperature inversion. There's no more water vapour left then, everything stops, there's no water, liquid water above that level. So that's the cloud top. Now, the liquid water content increases, as you can see. There's a lot of variation due to turbulence and some mixing uh, from the sides as well as some from the bottom and the top, etc. But on average, you can see that QL, or liquid water content, typically increases with height, roughly linear. And we're going to use that approximation that QL is proportional to Z. In this case, Z is the height above cloud base in deriving some equations for the optical depth, etc., as we'll see later. So bear that in mind, we have that sort of straight line in terms of increasing the water content to cloud height above cloud base. Okay, so we're going to look at um, several pictures now. I just wanted to go through what we're going to see beforehand so you understand what's coming. 
We're going to see some global average maps. There's going to be three of them. We're going to look at the global average sea surface temperature. We're going to look at the annual fraction amount of warm stratocumulus clouds. When we say warm, it means we're not forming ice in them. And we're going to look at the next cloud rate of forcing at the top of the atmosphere. What do we mean by that? Well, remember when we talked about delta F in terms of our aerosol layer? How does it affect the outgoing radiation? Well, this is the impact that clouds are going to have on the radiation balance compared to clear skies. So measure the radiation with clouds in the way versus radiation without clouds in the way. How does that F change? What's delta F? And remember we said that positive numbers, because we have to put a minus sign in front of that change, indicates a warming. Negative numbers mean there's going to be a cooling. Negative numbers mean we increase the amount of radiation going back to space. Positive means that we're reducing the amount of radiation that's going back to space. In other words, we're trapping more radiation, which eventually is going to warm the atmosphere. And these pictures are derived from a satellite experiment, or the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment, or ERBI. And what we're going to see, and I'd like you to focus on, are several regions. For example, the sea surface temperatures, you'll notice close to certain regions off the coast of California, we saw that previous experiment from the aircraft uh, experiment uh, results, Chile, and also the west coast of Africa. And the thing you'll notice is, if you look carefully, is that the sea surface temperatures in those regions seem to be much cooler than the ocean temperatures at the same latitude. So as you move further out, away from those coasts, the temperature of the ocean seems to get warmer. Part of the reason for that is due to the fact that westerly winds moving up along those latitudes is going to be essentially blocked by mountains. And of course, in the case of California, that's going to be the Rocky Mountains. In the case of um, South America, that's the Andes. And for Africa, it's going to be the African Plateau. So what happens when those winds are blocked is they tend to turn and move northwards along the coast. And it turns out that that, in com combination with upwelling cold water from the ocean tends to facilitate colder sea surface temperatures in those regions. And if we have a cooler ocean surface, then that tends to promote the formation of low-level clouds. So those regions tend to be much more cloudy as a result. So remember, cooler waters in turn cool the surface air. That leads to more cloud-topped marine boundary layers. The air above that marine boundary layer is usually very dry because it tends to descend from even higher in the atmosphere, usually the stratosphere. And that, as we said, stabilizes the top of those clouds, prevents any mixing with the layer above, and that leads to very persistent cloud sheets. So a warm, moist layer, a very dry layer, acts like a lid. So they tend to cover large areas, these clouds, and they last for quite a long time, as we saw in the average fraction of cloud. And as we'll see in the final graph, when we look at the top of, uh, when we look at the um, radiative effect, in other words, the net cloud radiative forcing from these clouds, that can actually be quite large. It can be of the order of 50 watts per meter squared cooling. So let's have a look at these pictures. These are they. Let's zoom in on, on them. This is the sea surface temperature. So where was the first area we wanted you to look at? Those are Chile, Peru you'll notice that the temperatures of the water here are the order of, say, 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. Sounds quite warm. However, if we move out, you will notice that the ocean temperatures get even warmer. In fact, these are colder than anywhere else, practically, on the planet at the same latitude. But as we move into the central Pacific, the temperatures are significantly warmer. And that's due to those upwelling cold ocean currents essentially interacting with the westerly flows which are blocked by the Andes and then forced along the coast northwards and that then drives those colder currents further up. And you can see the shape there that caused, that's caused by that uh, process. Similar effects occur off to off the uh, California coast, as you can see up there. Not quite as strong, but definitely there's also a gradient in temperature with latitude. And it's hard to see in this graph, but there's also an effect off the coast of West Africa. So these regions are very important. As we'll see, they lead to potential biases in climate models which have to be addressed. 
So there's the cloud amount, and yes indeed, if you look at the cloud amount of the coast of South America, it's very high compared to in the middle of the same latitude. If you look at the cloud amount of the coast of uh, Africa, again, it's much higher. Also off the coast of California. So that's why we get lots of uh, stratocumulus clouds formed in those regions. They're very persistent as a result. So let's finally look at the net radius of cloud forcing in watts per meter squared. Remember, negative means cooling, positive means warming. So let's look at our little region off the coast of South America. And you can see it's negative. And it can be quite substantially negative compared to near zero in the middle of the Pacific. Similarly, off the coast of Africa, and also off the coast of California. There are other phenomena going on off the coast of California in the northern Atlantic and Pacific, uh, which you'll learn about in other courses if you take them. So, this is why clouds are important. So let's have a look at an experiment to try and measure some of the properties of clouds to give you an idea how we calculate those properties and what those properties are. This was an experiment in which Manchester University PhD students were involved in. And if you're interested in clouds and how they interact with aerosols, there are plenty of projects available. This is the advertising. There are plenty of projects available on the school website, so have a look at those. And if you're interested in traveling the world to measure climate processes, please have a look at them. OK, so what is the experiment? Well, it was a very large international program. It was called um, VOCALS. The V actually stood for yet another acronym for an even larger program instigated by our US colleagues. It was called Variability of the American Monsoon Systems, but Vogel stood for Vamos Ocean Cloud Atmosphere Land Study. So it involved cloud physicists, aerosol scientists, oceanographers, satellite people as well. So the major goal was to try and develop and promote scientific activities to improve our understanding, improve mo uh, climate model simulations and predictions of what's called the Southeastern Pacific uh, region, or SEP. And to do that, you have to look at coupled ocean atmosphere land systems and interactions. And they wanted to look at it on diurnal as well as much longer time scales using models and satellites. So we're going to use this as an example to show how important clouds can be in those systems. So the first thing you want to do is look at the basic geography and the meteorology of that system, which we've uh, basically mentioned. This graph shows the sea surface temperatures. Remember, much colder sea surface temperatures here due to upwelling cold water uh, currents. Those are then pushed northwards due to the blocking of westerly flows by the Andes, and that produces this sort of <coughs> cold current transport to the north, and that then facilitates this formation of this very large stratocumulus cloud depth, as you can see there. Another interesting feature of South America, if you're more interested in aerosols, is that it actually has quite a lot of pollution along the coast, or pollution sources along the coast. All these little plumes here represent major cities, but also that region is home to some of the biggest mining activities in the world. The other interesting thing is a lot of those mining activities, smelters, etc., they're actually at high altitudes. The highest mines in the world are actually in the Andes. So we've got pollution being emitted at low level, but we've also got pollution being emitted at high level. So the aerosols can actually move over the top of the clouds, which we discussed previously. Uh, unfortunately, when the various governments there discovered that people were coming to make measurements of aerosol pollution as well as all the other things, they decided to turn off most of the smelters and send everybody a, a, on a holiday uh, during the experimental period. But that actually made the experiment much more, much simpler and easier to understand. But anyway, so it's one of the largest regions of stratocumulus cloud in the world at those latitudes. We have to try and understand all the interactions between the clouds, the aerosols, the marine boundary layer processes, also the upper ocean dynamics, the way that that's coupled with the atmosphere and we need to understand about other processes which we don't have time to discuss in this course, but happy to discuss it later if you're interested. 
as we talked about that, we, as we talked about the Andes act as this natural barrier to the zonal flow, and that encourages the formation of those big, cooler sea surface temperatures and formation of clouds. And coupled with the dry air aloft, that then produces this very persistent deck of stratocumulus clouds. And it lasts a long time. So the SEP, as far as an atmospheric science is concerned, provides what we call an ideal atmospheric laboratory in which to start to explore the effects of aerosols on cloud microphysics. As we'll see, the number of aerosols is going to influence the number of cloud droplets is going to contribute, is going to uh, affect the uh, optical depth of the cloud and the albedo. And we've already mentioned the mining activities, which can actually perturb the properties of the marine cloud layer. And that's one of the things we want to, uh, one of the many things we wanted to look at. So let's just remind you briefly of what happens when radiation interacts with a particle, in this case a spherical water particle. Once the um, soluble aerosol activates to produce a cloud droplet, you can get two extreme cases. If it's a very clean environment with very few aerosols, then what tends to happen is that the activated aerosols can grow quite large based on the amount of water vapor available. So you basically produce a few but quite large cloud droplets. In the extreme case, if you perturb that by adding lots of aerosols, you tend to activate lots of cloud droplets. But they're all competing for the same amount of water vapor in this case. That means that they can't grow as big. So you get lots of smaller droplets on average. How does that affect the albedo, the reflectivity of the cloud? Well, effectively, on the left-hand side, you've got less surface area, so less reflectivity. On the right-hand side, you've actually got more surface area, so they're more reflective. Remember those ship tracks we showed you from the satellite pictures? Lots of aerosol going into the atmosphere, producing very bright ship track plumes of clouds. The more smaller cloud droplets, the brighter the clouds appear, compared to a normal cloud. They don't actually look black, this is just an exaggeration, okay? So, keep that in mind. And the other problem is that um, if we have lots of small droplets, and we'll talk about this much later tomorrow, if we get lots of small droplets, it takes much longer to produce rain droplets because the process requires the presence of large droplets to scavenge out the smaller droplets. So if you've got fewer large droplets, then you don't produce rain as fast. If you don't produce rain as fast, then the clouds actually last longer, because once you produce rain, it tends to scavenge out all the water, dissipating the cloud before another one forms. That means the cloud in this case, this case over here, sorry, is going to last longer, so there's going to reflect back radiation for longer. So the cloud lifetime is affected. That's something else we'll talk about tomorrow. So we have to justify why we want to send some students to these exotic locations to have a nice time, sorry to do lots of work. So we turn to our modeling colleagues, and this shows some model results from an old climate model called HADGEM1, uh, developed by the UK Met Office. It wasn't a particularly high resolution model. The horizontal resolution within the model had a grid scale of around about 200 kilometers or so, so not particularly high resolution. And what we see here is the difference between the predicted sea surface temperature from that model and the actual sea surface temperature measured by satellite. In other words, it's the model minus the real measurements. So when we see red, it means that the model is over predicting the sea surface temperature. And again, you can see these regions, California, South America, West Coast of Africa. In other words, the model is over-predicting the sea surface temperature significantly. That's what we call a positive model bias. So we have to figure out how to improve the model to get that down to somewhere in here. So clearly, as we mentioned, those regions are regions of major upwelling from the ocean. And those are also regions where we have a lot of stratocumulus cloud formed. That's where the model biases are large, so we have to improve it. Now, part of the reason which we've just indicated or implied is that the model resolution wasn't very good. So before we even went on this experiment, a new model was developed called HiGEM, much higher resolution. 
And previous work had shown that really these big climate models didn't really capture the zonal flow blocking and how the winds were altered. They didn't capture the amount of blocking and the perturbation northwards. So the new model was able to show that. It's a bit hard to see what's going on in this graph. It's a bit confusing. That just about see the coast of South America there. But what this shows is the mean sea surface temperature difference of the new model minus the old Adgen model. New model is called Adgen. And of course, where it's blue, it means that the new model is basically predicting a lower surface temperature. So yes, the new model, because it's able to capture those winds, is tending to predict a lower temperature for the sea surface temperature. Not perfect, but it's doing a better job. So that was encouraging. So we had to go there and make some measurements and make sure the model was actually performing as shown in this diagram. As we said, climate models generally have difficulty in simulating stratocumulus clouds because they can't capture all the physics. We have to use a few parameters that can be inferred from satellites, which are then compared with in situ measurements, which are then compared with climate models. And that can lead to biases in the models, which we have to address with experiments. Now, part of the bias is not just the resolution of the model, but also that we can't really represent these clouds very well in climate models. There are all sorts of processes, turbulence, drizzle formation, and also large-scale mesoscale organization, which you can learn about in other courses in abstract science. Uh, for example, Dr. Sh uh, Professor Schultz. So that tends to lead to a poor representation of clouds in general, particularly the formation of rain. And as we said, the old models didn't have the resolution to capture the airflow patterns with sufficient resolution. But not only that, remember these are what are called coupled climate models. It's not just the atmosphere they're trying to model, they're trying to model, simulate the ocean currents as well. And it turned out the resolution models weren't good enough to also model those upwelling currents very accurately either. So it's all about improving the models using real world information. So this is the experiment. So being an American experiment, of course, they have to design a nice uh, patch you can wear on your jacket. And this one was funded uh, in the UK by the Natural Environmental Research Council, NERC. And it involved all these universities, research labs, and operational centers. Operational centers are the UK Meteorological Office, the uh, European Center for Medium Weather Forecast, etc., etc and also the Bureau of Meteorological Research in Australia. So all those guys come together with several aircraft, several ships, uh, instrument buoys, some of them which are fixed, some of which are allowed to float with the currents. And at the same time, the whole experiment was coordinated with overpasses by satellites. So it's a very detailed experiment organized by our American colleagues. The total cost of that project was $25 million. Sounds like a lot, but don't forget it's shared with amongst all these institutes. Much cheaper than buying a Premier League footballer these days. So, good value for money, I would say. This is the research aircraft, which we use and was deployed out of uh, near Peru. Some of you might reference this is a picture of the inside of the aircraft with all the instruments. Some of you might recognize this gentleman if you've already been on the courses, some of our Nanjing colleagues here. Anybody recognize this person? Yes, somebody said it. That's Dr. Williams, he was obviously much younger in those days. And there's another person in the background, you can hardly make out, that's actually Dr. James Allen. So he was there as well. And there's also another person in the background measuring, uh, setting up instruments to measure cloud physics. So we won't mention who that is. Anyway, that was the experiment, and we also had a number of PhD students involved as well. So I'm just going to show you highlights from one experiment, uh, and this is what's called a 20 South Lagrangian flight. And the reason why it's called a 20 South Lagrangian flight is pretty obvious. The aircraft takes off uh, near Peru, and then it basically flies south until it hits the 20 degrees south latitude line, and then flies out to almost 80 degrees longitude. So it flies out, these are the Andes here, it flies up to high level along and it descends to very close to the surface, about 50 
sorry, uh, 15 meters or so, and then it makes lots of profiles up and down through the boundary layer, including up and down through clouds. Now, this particular cross section of that flight up there on this particular day, we've color coded according to, sorry, it's hard to read here, this scale. This is actually the concentration of carbon monoxide. Why carbon monoxide? Well, remember, carbon monoxide is a good tracer for pollution. Red, very high, 80 parts per billion. Blue, about 40 parts per billion. So, what can you see from that trace? Obviously, the aircraft can't be everywhere at once. But what it shows is that there seems to be high concentrations of CO up here, very high altitude. But this is where the Andean foothills go. So around about just below eight kilometers, we see high concentrations here. We also see very high concentrations close to the coast, at low level. Nothing really in between. That implies there must be a pollution source at high level over here somewhere, and also a pollution source at low level here. And you can see this plume, which is going to disperse and dilute as you move out from the coast, still exists at this level, but then seems to have disappeared by the time we've got all the way out here. However, you'll notice up here, the plume, which is high concentration, has essentially vanished at the same altitude, but still remnants of it here. It looks as though this plume is descending. So we've got warmer air that's actually descending here. So that's interesting. It looks as though we do indeed have a very similar marine boundary layer to the case that we showed from the United States in California. So let's have a look at the thermodynamics. Now, you'll learn about the thermodynamics in other courses, but you don't need to know it too much for this course. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that we do have a very stable marine boundary layer in this experiment. Now, you remember that high altitude uh, part of the flight? Those circles represent points where somebody gets up and drops out of the aircraft something called a drop song. Some of you who do these first two courses may have already released balloons with radio songs on them. This is the opposite. So a little package with a little parachute is dropped out of the aircraft at each of those points, and as it goes down to the sea surface, it measures temperature, humidity, and it also measures winds as well in speed and direction. <coughs> So let's just look at three of those drop sonde profiles at the red points. And for those of you who haven't seen these sorts of diagrams before, I know some of you have, these are similar to what we call T5 grams. Instead of altitude and vertical, we have pressure, so it's not a linear scale apology, so 1,000 millibars going up to maybe a couple hundred millibars. And along here we have increasing temperature. We haven't got time in this course to discuss all the various other lines, which are very saturated and dry elastic mass rate, theoretical lines. The red line shows the temperature. And if you look very closely, you can see the temperature seems to decrease linearly with height, well-mixed layer. The blue line is what's called the dew point temperature. If you were to breathe onto a window, and the window happens to be cold, because the air outside might be very cold, eventually you're going to produce condensation on that window. What's happening, as we can see, is that as the air rises, or as we go up with the air parcels, you can see that the dew point starts to approach that red line. The dew point, effectively, is the temperature you have to cool that air down <coughs> before condensation occurs. Where the red and the blue line meet, that effectively is where condensation might occur, where clouds might be produced. So you can see in this region up here, just below, about 900 millibars, it's hard to see on this resolution. You can see this is probably where we're going to get cloud form. Then we have a big increase in temperature. So this is our dry layer up here. We know it's dry because the difference between the temperature and the dew point is much larger compared to in this boundary layer here. And as we go further out, you can notice two things. You notice the point at which we see the lifting condensation level where clouds start to form is a little bit higher, a little bit higher again, so it's sort of the cloud base is going up and up and up as we go further out. But you'll also notice that the difference between the temperature and the dew point gets bigger and bigger. So this really is a very large dry layer of air over the top of a relatively moist marine boundary layer. You can also notice these wind barbs here, if you're interested. Those are the wind speeds and directions and what they effectively show that as we move towards the coast, the winds are decreasing as we expect, because of the blocking of the Andes. 
So everything seems to be fitting in with our understanding of the basic meteorology and the dynamics of boundary layer. So let's look at some cloud physics measurements. I'm not going to show all of them. The top graph shows the droplet number concentration measured by the aircraft as it went up and down through clouds within the marine boundary layer between about eight or 900 metres up to one and a half kilometres. You will notice the colour scale. So red is 300, blue is about 100 per cc. So that's ND, the number of droplets per cc. You notice the clouds close to the coast uh, fairly high number concentrations. As we move further out, clouds get a little bit higher, but you notice that the number concentrations are significantly lower, down to about 100, as we go right out about this point here. So high concentrations, lots of droplets, low concentrations out here. If we actually measure the liquid water content, which is shown in the same graph below, high liquid water content, 0.4, the units in this particular case are grams per cubic meter, that doesn't really matter. We're just simply trying to show you that high liquid water content is red, blue is about 0.1, 0.15. You see that these clouds, even though they've got high number concentrations of droplets, the liquid water content is very small. That implies the droplets are very small, even though there's a lot of them, because the liquid water content goes as the volume. We have to sum up the volume of all those droplets. So, we've got these clouds here which have high concentrations of small droplets and low liquid water content. If we move further out, we can see that the liquid water content, they do increase as we go up through the cloud, but generally we see higher liquid water content, up to 0.4 or even higher grams per cubic meter. So, in other words, the droplets out here, even though there's fewer of them, they're much bigger so the liquid water content is actually, on average, bigger. So that's to be kept in mind, and you can see that in these profiles of liquid water content through different clouds as we move from the coast further out. And again, there's a lot of variation due to turbulence and mixing, but on average, you can see that the change in liquid water content, which we're going to call QL as a function of height, is approximately constant, so dQL, dz, is a constant. That's very important when we derive these equations. Okay. Basic variables and definitions. <coughs> Cloud droplet effective radius. Remember we looked at these various different size distributions. We can't actually put all those into a climate model, so we have to come up with something called a cloud droplet effective radius, R sub E. And that's essentially the average scattering cross-sectional radius, or the ratio of the third to second moments of the size distributions, if you want to look at it that way. So that's just given by that equation, where n of r is the number of drops for a particular size. So essentially, we're sort of comparing the volume radius to the uh, area radius, if you, if you put it that way. Then, of course, we have the liquid water content, QL, which we mentioned. That's simply summing up the volume of all those droplets, n of r, multiplying by the density of water. So that's the basic two parameters that we need, the effective radius, or cloud droplet effective radius of our cloud, and liquid water content. And we also mentioned, when we talk about aerosol, QE and KE. So what is the extinction coefficient of cloud droplets? Well, remember, it's the product of the number of droplets of a particular size times the extinction cross-section sigma which we can write in terms of the extinction efficiency Q, which we defined in a previous lecture. Now, if you put liquid water droplets into a meat scattering model, typical sizes, refractive index of water, it turns out that QE is about 2 for solar wavelengths. So let's put 2 in that equation. So KE we can simplify by 3 halves QL over the effective radius, times rho W. Go back and check by substitution of 1 and 2 into 3. And if you integrate that, you end up by getting the optical depth, remember, which is just the product of K and Z, so we have to integrate through the cloud from Z equals zero cloud base to the height, and we end up with this integral here. So we'll finish this tomorrow, where we're going to go back over this integration, but your homework is to essentially derive the equation on the next slide, ready for tomorrow, if you can. Right, thank you for coming. Any questions? That's it.
you all look as though you're in a rush to get off somewhere. Thank you. 